You are now tuned in to, to Clearly, Clearly Culture. Culture. What's up, y'all? Episode six of Clearly Culture, the podcast. I'm Young Jazz, my boy, Mike, Mike Mills, Mills boy, Jay Mac, and we got the living legend right here from Texas, man, Paul Wall, the People's Champ, with us. What's going on, Paul? How what are it you, do? Man? I'm so happy to finally have you on the podcast, too. Of Listen, course, you just I'm recently went viral. Look, Jay Mac, this is all he's been wanting to talk about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, it's like a, a new win. What's yeah. going on, man? I mean, I finally let my hair grow out, you know. <laughs> what made you want to grow your hair out? I just seen other people grow it out. Yeah. I, honestly, when I seen Lil' Kiki start growing his hair out, honestly, that's what, you know, it would inspire See, me. See, you lucky you can grow it Yeah, out, yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? We're trying to get Jay Mack to grow his hair out, but it's rough over here. For yeah, well, you know, my, my stages, the growth stages were tough for me. See, mm -hmm. but this is what, what did it, is mm -hmm. I would get a south side fade, okay? South side fade leaves just a little patch at the front of your head. The rest of my hair will be bald faded. Right. And I got a little bumps and knots in my head. I got a misproportioned <laughs> head. So when my hair start growing back, it looked like I got bald spots. Right. So I, I just kept telling That's why I wear hats all the time because it looked like I got bald spot, but I really mm -hmm. don't. It's just my hair will be growing back from the south side fade. That's so I said, wild. I, I got to do something about that. look at the over 21 with this hair out. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Paul, how old you now? Uh, 42. Man. Man. And Paul, for those who I don't know, like what side of Houston like, did you grow up on? I grew up on the northwest side. Yeah, gotcha, grew up gotcha. on the northwest so side. So how'd you get all this flavor, Paul? You got to take them all the way back. For those who don't know, there <laughs> yeah. has to be a reason. There has to be a way. Where yeah. did the flavor come from? You just got The flavor, you just got slow cook in the pot. And the, the seasoning gets <laughs> added throughout the time, you know. Uh, but it's just, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a lot similar to everybody I grew up with. Mm -hmm. You know, you sit down with Kameen and we're going to have some slight differences just being, you know, I, I, my family came originally from, t you know, from Texas. My grandparents came from North Carolina. So mm -hmm. there's, the, you know, a little bit of influences here and there. But you talk to Kameen and we're going to have a lot of the same beliefs or how we act, or our morals, or, you know, similar. Or, or a lot of other people, Lucky Luciano, uh, you know, uh, my boy Zone. We all grew up in the same area together, you know, so mm -hmm. we're all very similar. So what got you into rap music? Yeah. On the school bus, just something that everybody would do. Of course, growing up, listening to 979 The Box, this was something that, you know... Even you grew back, up listening to The Box? Matter of fact, 979 The Box and Magic 102 used to beef back in the days. What? They, they were like both hip-hop really? stations. And they used to kind of like beef. And then I don't know if this was before they like before became, you know, sister stations or something. Mm -hmm. or But the formats were different growing up. So those were, the, those were, it was, you know, we, it was dope back then having multiple hip-hop stations. And then it, the format changed. It became more like... R&B specific and 979 The Box was just a hip hop but you know growing up you would hear you know the roll call in the morning and we, we do the same thing on the bus or whatever and it was just something we all did so I had, I just had a, a, a little knack for it and then like I said growing up with Kameen it, it definitely probably helped me where you right. know what I'm saying we, we are iron sharp and iron y'all went to school together we, when we grew up together since we were like 5 6 years old since elementary school yeah Dang. yeah and then take take me back to Jersey Village, Village High School. So that that because I feel like that's an important part yeah. of your journey. That 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 really is what I would assume got you into the music side. Is yeah. I read that you started off actually as a promoter. Yeah, back in those days, I had a god sister that went to Eisenhower High School. I went to Jersey Village. Okay, there would be these parties at the All Star, which would be like a sports complex. They had like an arcade, batting cages. You know, you could go buy sporting equipment there whatever stuff like that but on fridays they would rent it or it'd be like once a month kind of thing they'd rent it out and throw parties so when you're 14 13 it's like oh they got like a little teenage club over we can go to we go there michael watts would be djing uh og ron c would be djing and i went to church with og ron c family his his mom his stepdad his grandmother his sisters they were all i was real real close with them so OG Ron C always kind of took me under his wing, and Michael Watts also was somebody where, like I said, my god sister went to Eisenhower. That's how I would learn about the party. She went to Eisenhower, and it would be one or two people from Jersey Village from my school that would be at the party, but not too many. So I said, man, look, I got who, who's doing the promotions? We got to pass out some flyers at, at my school or at South Falls or these other schools out there that we would, you know, go to our track meets or go to our football, basketball games. Let's promote out there so we can. We got to represent too. We got to show up. So we would actually make our own flyers for the parties for the All Star. With my shout out to my dog Smooth G, uh, and we would just promote at our school. And we, I would do it just so that I could get in free. I just skipped the line and getting, you know, you're 13, like that's the world. You could get in free. Okay, you're very young. So tell me this: being a white boy was it hard rapping at this particular time? Now I know it's accepted now, but at that particular time, how hard was it? 
Honestly, I didn't know I was white. <laughs> <You know? laughs> really? I mean, it was. I never thought of it like that. Hon honestly, the whole entire time, I, I saw it as a challenge to rap in general. I never got any like where people are like, "Hey, white boy, this white boy, that." I never got like any, any of that type of criticism. I also never brought any of it where I'm like not not bringing it up in my raps. It was, it was just something where I saw it as it's it's tough to make it no matter who you are because I didn't really have anyone to look to to see. This is how you make it. I mean, even even in high school, Slim Thug was on the Switch House tapes. To us, he, he was larger than life. That was as big as, you know, like, man, this is somebody from our area. Right. We, we know he goes to school with my sister. Like, man, this is, he's all, all everybody would jam, you know, when you're riding down the street or at the, you know, the car wash stuff. So Slim Thug was Jay-Z when we was in high school. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's who really, that's why I, I always salute Slim because he always has been a leader of our era, our generation of right. rap. Like, we always have... Follow the leader with. I tell them all the time. They when they joking about, hey, what you gonna do, man? Whatever Slim do, whatever he, whatever <laughs> whatever his strategy is, we gonna we gonna follow it because he he always been a leader. So big salute to Slim. And Thug. Paul, speaking of the Swisher House, all right. So 1999, you and Chameleon Air, y'all obviously doing y'all thing. You were doing the promoting side. Now, did Chameleon Air also do the promoting as well? He would also, but that was kind of like okay, like I said, when we would do these parties, Kamina always was a dope artist. Like he could draw his ass off. So. He would kind of draw the flyers up, and I would pass them out. So we, he contributed, and he would pass them out a little bit. But you know, he always, Kamean always been a boss too. So he, you know, some of the other pass out flyer type work was kind of like, <laughs> yeah. he ain't doing that. He should get somebody else to do it. So for what, him. what led me? What, I would, yeah, I'm, let me pass these things <laughs> out. I would trip it. What led y'all to getting on the first Swisher House tape? Because if you look up, that's kind of like where everything started from the music side was when y'all got on the, I believe it was the Swish House Project in 1999. Yep, chopping them up part two. And uh, and the day hell broke loose part one. Uh, but it, at that time, okay, to go back in time, going in a time machine, at that time, Swisher House was the hottest thing smoking. Anybody who even thought about rapping was trying to, especially if you on the north side, where well, we from the north side. So if you trying to rap, the way to make it is rap on the Swish House because you could be an overnight instant right. celebrity now you had to come with it but overnight everyone would know your name you'd be in stores across the state or across the south and you'd be a house especially if you, if you wrecked it out of nowhere you'd be a household name okay so how hard was those sessions you got slim you got all of y'all in there how competitive was it it was for us it was it's impossible it was impossible because they also it's very competitive no one's gonna say, "Hey, get him a shot." You know, nah, right. it's gonna be, man, nah, we ain't gonna, nah, you, you good. And what, it, what took it, what really made it happen was, I was already doing promotions for the Switch House for Michael Watts. I would also help uh, do some of the distribution where I bring some of the tapes or, or CDs to the different stores. But it was, you know, me not hounding them to get on the tape. Because right. I, I would be with, with Michael Watts, and I would see people left and right coming up to him to rap on the tape, and it'd be, like, overwhelming, where it's like, man, it don't matter how good they are, you can't put a 1,000 people on one mixtape. Right. So it, he just would kind of be one of those things where if you if you ask, the answer is no. So you just don't ask. <laughs> so for me, I would always be like, man, I'm scared to ask, because if I ask, yeah. he might change my name to Do Not Answer. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. But as long as I don't, because I see him do that, you right. know? It, it, as long as I don't bring, he knew we rapped. You know what I'm saying? He knew we had aspirations to to be MC. He always respected that, but he always told me too that rapping on the Swish Owls mixtape was for promotional purposes. Right. <laughs> That's not your career because at the time Swish Owls wasn't a record label. It was right. Mix, it was mixtape. Right. So he would say, "Hey, look, if you're trying to promote some merch, some clothes, <laughs> an event, a party." You know, an album coming out, then come rap on a Switch House tape. But if this is your career, is rapping on Switch House, nah, that's not how we looked at it. Okay, so then when did it become a career for you? Okay, when I was I was putting up, it was a store that used to be on Cross Timbers right by 45. I was, I was doing promotions for Cash Money, Def Jam, and No Limit at the time, where I was like the lower lower on the totem pole, but I would be there putting up the, putting up the posters, doing promotions. I'm doing that. I see Michael Watts doing some Swish House stuff, and I happen to ask him, hey, I, now keep in mind, I loved Cash Money Records, Manny Fresh, Hot Boys, loved them at the time. I said, Watts, I got a question. How come I don't never hear no Swish House rappers? I, I don't never hear Slim Thug, Lil Mario, PJ rapping on a Manny Fresh beat. 
And he would say, well, the rappers, they just pick what beat they want to rap on, and they pick other beats for whatever. And I, man, I said, man, look, y'all got to rap on some Manny Fresh beats. Them the hardest beats. And he said, what's your favorite Manny Fresh beat? I said, man, that BG Cash Money is the army. Ooh. And he, he started, like, beatboxing it right there, kind of, like, humming it, bum, 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 bum. Uh-huh. And I, he was like, okay, yeah, that is hard. And he, and he just, and he asked me, he said, what would you say on it? Give it to us. What? what did you yes, say? Yes, do you remember? I freestyled. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> don't know. No, I don't know. It was something, you know, you're talking about 30 years ago. You're talking about something in 98. This was 98. And what happened after <laughs> you did the freestyle? So he said, come on, let's go to the Dust Bowl. That's what he called the actual Swisher house because mm-hmm. it was a house he grew up in. It was dusty. He called it, he called it the <laughs> Dust Bowl. Come on, we're going to the Dust Bowl. We're going to lay it right now. Right. Went over there, laid it down, laid down another one. I, I think I did something to Bling Bling. And, and Lil Ron, who was like, 13, 12 years old at the time. He can't. He lived a couple houses down. He knocked on the door and watched us like, hey, meet Lil Ron. He a new artist. I just signed. I grew up with his parents. I just signed him to the Swisher house. You know, he a little younger, but I just signed him. And I met Lil Ron, and, I, you know, we chopped it up a lot. But it's, you know, it was one of those things where it was like, Shh. Hey, I just I, did I just sign too? I don't know. Is it because I'm doing these freestyles? But this before the freestyles come out, they actually, this is what happened a lot. Freestyles, you know, whatever we would do, the sessions would, like get deleted for whatever reason. The, what? the, the, it would crash. The hard drive would crash. Oh, you know, man. so it would always happen. Oh, but he called me, say I got good news and bad news. Bad news is uh, a hard drive crash. I lost the two flows, so Ooh. they didn't make it to a switch house tape. But he said the good news is you got another shot. Come on over. We're gonna come do something today. I came over there. I said, man, can I bring him in? Of course. You know, he knew we were boys anyway. We were in a rap group. So he was like, yeah, bring him. And we actually, we, we tried to bring our other boy too, but I think he was busy. My boy PKT, I think something happened he couldn't come. Right. But we went over there to, uh, to, to do our thing. And we actually, you know, and as a fan of it, right, you would rarely hear DJ Screw rapping. But when you did, it was classic. Right. I never had heard ever once Michael Watts rapping. Uh-huh. Man, I said, watch, why you don't, why you don't never rap? And he said, I, I don't know, I just never did. It was like, me and Command, it was kind of like, we was like, hey, man, why don't you rap on this one with us? Because we knew if Michael Watts was on there rapping, it's instantly going viral. The right. first time he ever rapped on us, which I'll say, we, we right. think, oh, this is going to go viral. We know he's not going to be whack, and then he there with me and Command. So even if he do say something, Command or me, we could tell him, nah, man, you know, just say it like this or whatever. But, you know, he came with his flow. But it don't matter. You're flowing. You're freestyling. So right. even right. if it's whack, it's, it is what it is. Sometimes the, the flavor will be more important than the words. You actually say how you say it. It may uh-huh. be more important than what you're actually saying. But that is, you know, we, we made it on the tape, and that's the one that really, like, it was the first time we was ever on a, a tape, and that, like, planted the seed for us. But when I did my flow on uh, that bag lady, that explosive, uh-huh. it, it, man, mm-hmm. that, burr, 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 burr. man, that was the one. That was the one? That was the one. And guys, do me a favor real quick. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and now back to the episode. Yeah, How was your yeah. interactions with DJ Screw? Because you brought up DJ Screw, and you were in an area where you got to see him right before he passed. Man, I used to do promotions. So imagine, like, a 14-year-old Paul Wall in 1995. You know, I'm 15, 96, 16, 97. So imagine me... At that time, imagine that era, DJ Screw, all the stuff that's coming out, like Pimp the Pin, all the all the little Kiki stuff. Uh-huh. Aside from just the mixtapes, I would see him when I'm passing off. So imagine a little kid walking up to DJ Screw, handing DJ Screw a flyer for Method Man's new album that's about to drop on Def Jam. That was me. You know what I'm saying? I'm hey, this Jay Z new album that's coming out. You know, here's whatever. You know, so that was me. That was my interaction with him. Where, hey. I, DJ Screw, hey, we'll, we'll say something. Now, I, I, I'm just gonna go give him a flyer. Hey, hey, here go flyer. You know, just so I can say I gave DJ Screw a flyer. But right. th- those were like the majority of my interactions. Or like we'd be outside Jamaica, Jamaica. You know, Richmond and Kirby. It's no, it's not there no more. They, I think they relocated it. But it, that was like, awesome. you know, that was the spot. Definitely was the spot. I, DJ Screw used to pull up in that blue Impala. You know, I'd see him. He'd pull up just the parking lot pimp. Get some from Boogity Boudin, man, and then keep it moving. So that's why I see him. I be, you know, hop behind him in line with Boogity Boogity Boudin, man, yeah. just to just to get some of the grub. But you know, I, I always was a fan. So like my interaction was, you know, looking back at the time, he was larger than he's still larger than life, man. Right. Rest in peace, Absolutely. DJ Screw. But at the time, coming from the north side, it wasn't 
a, a possibility. It, I couldn't I couldn't conceive the idea of me knocking on DJ Screw door asking him to rap on a, a, a mixtape. But after hearing everyone else's DJ Screw journey, there's no doubt in my mind if I had knocked it might have taken me a thousand knocks. I might have had to show up every single day, but there's right. no doubt that I believe it. If I would have tried, he would have gave me some type of opportunity. But at the time, I couldn't conceive that. All I could see was I'm just a fan, and I'm just you know grateful uh, to be in the presence of yeah. DJ Screw. So yeah. you took us on the journey from promoter to music, and I got to ask you because part of the journey was obviously, and you brought him up, was Chameleonaire. And uh, tell me about how the color changing click came to life. That was something where, you know, within the Swisher House, there was always, you know, kind of like a core group of members, but everybody kind of had their little crew on the side. Well, that was kind of us, the color changing click, where 5050 Twin, he was, you know, a core member, Boss Hawk, Swisher House, all of that. Lou Hawk would only come on, rap a couple times here and there, but it, that's basically what it was, just me, Chameleon, and Lou Hawk, and 5050 Twin. We all grew up together. You know, 50 50 twin, both of him and his brother, we went we went to school together since, you know, fifth, sixth grade. So it's like, come in, like I said, I've known come in since like kindergarten, you know. So it's, these are, uh, uh, you know, you, you grow up together, you kind of form a bond of when you get an opportunity to showcase, you want to do it together. We really supported each other. So it was something that we really have been building, like, without even realizing it, you know, at a real, real early age. Uh, and then once we, once we all kind of got our shine on, we kind of came together with it. But, yeah, shout out to the Color Change and Click do you, community. Do you think that that shine and the attention that y'all brought together at such an early age also had something to do with y'all also falling out for a little bit as well? Probably because, you know, when you together with somebody for so many years of your life, day in, day out, 24 hours a day, well, we lived a few houses down, so you'd wake up and, you know, I'd be at his house, he'd be at my house. You know, you'd be there all day. Whatever you're right. doing, you're going to play basketball, you're doing it together. you going to the mall, you're doing it together. Whatever. You're going to fight, we fighting somebody together. Mm -hmm. We might, be fighting, we might yeah. be fighting each other, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. But this is like what, it's like what we did where we really grew up, like, close, like brothers. So it was one of those things where it's kind of almost bound to happen. And then also, you know, the pot is only so big. We have our own paths. We have our own journeys that God mm -hmm. has a path for me and a path for him. And we started together, and we intertwined here and there, you know what I'm saying? And a, a big part of the journey was together, but we definitely have our own separate paths. And then, you know what? I like to say that. Once that journey ended, you got with your wife. Uh -huh. And that became your new partner in crime. Wait, sure. When did y'all meet? What year y'all met? It was, it's funny you say that because it was the same year, basically, and around the same time, me, me and my wife, we've been together since October of 2003. And 20 years. And 2003 was around the time me and Kamina really where the division was like, all right, it's only a matter of time before we no longer are working together at all. You know what I'm saying? Where, so once 2004 came around, me and Kamina for sure were like on our separate journeys completely. You know what I'm saying? And how did you know so that? She for sure filled in that void where I needed somebody, and I right. needed, you know, for sure. Yes, and how did you know she was the one? Because at this particular time, y'all are getting to the height of y'all's success. How did you know this this lady was the lady that would go on the journey of life with you? Man, a lot of it, I, I stepped out in faith. It's something I had been asking God for for a long time, you know, praying for it, being faithful in my own journey so that God would be faithful to me and give me what I'm asking for or what I need, whether I'm asking for it or not. So it's something I was really just looking for, not necessarily searching for, but I was aware of this is this is my goals, these are my life goals, this is who I'm looking for in a partner, and I'm I'm not playing around no more. You know what I'm saying? Like what? when I find it, I'm I'm ready. What? But you know, what? But, but, <laughs> <laughs> the first time we met was uh, on TSU campus when we both were freshmen. And uh, oh, actually, I even though we're the same age, you know, a lot of people, you know, Michael Jordan, Michael B. Jordan, don't mean to, you know, I don't mean to brag. I did uh, graduate a year early, um, okay. so I graduated early. Matter of fact, because I you graduated in '98. Like I was what? supposed to graduate in 99, but I graduated in 98. Uh -huh. So I, just from going to so many honors classes, I went to summer school for one year, night school for one year, and skipped the whole grade of high school. What you go to school for? 
or at University of Houston. Yeah. For, uh, well, I didn't know. I ain't graduated three years of college. Oh, okay, okay, No, 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 no. I'm still, oh, okay, gotcha. I'm still, I'm on enrolled currently, but They'll you know what I'm saying? They'll give you a degree, it's okay. Yeah, They'll I'm give not you done. Yeah, you I, got three, you got three I'm, years behind you. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, got, I do got three years under my belt. I'm, I'm going to finish it off at TSU. I went to U of H, but I'm going to finish it off at TSU. But I met her at, um, I met my wife at TSU campus just walking around. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you realize later that you had met previously. You know what I'm saying? It's like, damn, I remember that. I remember that too. You know, one of them situations. I met her again later on in life outside of Club Rhythms. She was an aspiring singer in a music group. I'm an aspiring rapper trying to do my thing. I'm selling CDs. She's selling CDs. I ended up buying one of her CDs because I didn't want to look broke. <laughs> and it ended up being scratched. So oh. it was like destined for us to meet again. And then me and my boy Goo used to do this club downtown called Club Play. So I reached out to her through somebody. Hey, man, tell her, come bring me a new CD because the CD I bought was scratched. Okay, so after all these times I met her, when I seen her that day, I'll never forget. She had a, a wife beater and she had a hair and a ponytail and it was love at first sight. Oh Even though it was the third God. time I seen her, this was love at first sight. Where I, I couldn't, where... Like, her soul spoke to me, like, where she walked by, and I can't, like, I can't keep my eyes off her kind of thing, where it's not, like, not, no creepy kind of thing, but it's, like, I don't know. You you don't want to mess it up because you know it's something special. But I have to say this. Um, I got a partner by the name of Cat, and he used to go on the road with Paul Wow, and he would be, like, Paul Wow would turn down some money so he could get home to be with his wife. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. man, that's incredible. Yeah. Oh, it's a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, if Paul <laughs> couldn't do it and get back home yeah. to his wife, he would turn it down. Yeah. And I mean, first of all, I want to say it's incredible to have a marriage this long in hip hop. But you know what I love more than that? It's never been a scandal. Yeah. I never heard Paul Wall mm -hmm. has been out there cheating or got kids by another woman. Right. How do you yeah. go on the straight and narrow and keep it like that? Well, you know, they say if you can't stay in the heat, don't go in the kitchen. So I don't go in the kitchen. I don't play around with none of that. I know my boundaries. You know, she know where my heart at. But at the same time, a lot of it is in faith. I got Because the same way I could be cheating on her, she could be cheating on me, and I would never know. You know what I'm saying? So it's a, a lot of it is faith. And to me, it's a, I can't ask from somebody what I'm not willing to give as well. So I always give the 100% uh, where I, I, this is what I, I'm, I want in return. You know, where... I don't want I don't want to share you with somebody else. You know, we're, we're committed. And that's something we really, you know, a lot of our ideologies, how we feel, what we feel about the world. You know, even my, my mom and my stepdad, they've been married, you know, 40 years. You know, I'm <laughs> old 30 something, almost 40 years. My mother-in-law and my father-in-law before my father-in-law passed away, they were married. 30 some years, you know, so it's something where we had it, you know, in us, this is what we want. We want a life partner to really raise a family with, you know, and I, I don't know if, you know, why it's so hard, but sex really is a drug for some people. I don't mean that lightly, like, oh, I'm a sex addict, but I just mean that some people, they don't look at it the same way food could be a drug. When you get addicted, you don't realize next thing you know, you gain 50 pounds, man. It's the same way with sex. People don't realize when it's open and easy for you to get it and then, you don't think nothing of it because you're like, okay, I'm living my best life right now, you know. But, right. you, you know, everybody don't want the same things. And, I don't, I mean, I don't judge or knock nobody else who doing what they do or want what they want. This is what I want. This right. will work for me. And people be quick to say, too, like, oh, we're going to get married, do it. Like, man, look, if, if it's not meant for y'all to be married, don't rush into it because it might not be the right time, might not be the right situation. You might not be right in your growth. They might not be right in their growth. You rush into something too soon and you could – Ruin the forever aspect because you just weren't ready. I'm glad you said that because I want to take it back. Because at one particular point of your career, you had got big. But since that particular time, you have stayed small. How did you do that? <laughs> Man, look, it was tough. It was tough for me to lose three pounds. Really? <laughs> Man, I would, I would run like seven miles a day. You know, either in my neighborhood, on a treadmill. I used to do this every single day. Matter of fact, I used to struggle in my performing. And I asked Young Jeezy one time, I said, man, Jeezy, man, how you so good with your breath? Because he actually, he like messed up something in his throat or something. And he had to have surgery. So I asked him, I said, man, how'd you bounce back from that? How you, you know, how you built your, uh, your, your, your stage presence up so much with your, your breath control? And he told me he used to do his show while he run on a treadmill. So I used to do that. So I'd be on the treadmill for 45 minutes, an hour, every single day going over my show, just memorizing my words, running, jogging as I perform, you know, as I perform. So that when I'm on the stage, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not all out of breath. But I would do all of that. I would 
my diet would be completely A1, and I'd lose, you know, two, three months would go by, and it'd be one pound down. And be like, man, it was some. I, I, I attribute all of that to the lifestyle I was living. You know, whether it was drinking, sipping, taking diet pills to try to lose weight, and then that mess up, you know, how you lose weight, mess up your metabolism because it throw it off. Or whether it was the fast food I was eating, the times of day I was eating it, the, the lack of exercise, or any of it. Maybe it was the soda I was drinking. It was That's what I attribute the uh, how hard it was for me to, uh, to lose the weight to. But I ended up having surgery, and it saved my life. Okay, yeah. speaking of that surgery... Now, Big Boy had the same surgery. Right, right. But he had it a long time ago. Yeah. And it was hard for him. How hard has it been for you? It's, man, shout out to Big Boy, too. Me and him took a trip to Iraq, and he was a big influence on me because I used to want, like, man, I want to get, but back in those, I used to think, like, Man, I used to be worried what people would say concerned. Now it's like, man, I would, man, what? This. I mean, it saved my life, but it changed my life too. I don't gotta work out. I don't gotta worry about what I eat now. <laughs> man, what? What? I would have been did this, man. I would have, I would have did this 15 years previous, man. And what type of surgery nothing. did you have? It's called a gastric sleeve, where they make your stomach. Your stomach normally about to be the size of your fist. They make it like the size of your thumb. Oh, hell no. What? So you're not hungry, crazy. though, and no. stuff. Oh, and hell and no. they take out the, the hormone that makes you hungry. They cut that out. So I'll go the whole day and won't be hungry. I'll get grumpy yeah. from not having, like, vitamins but and everything. But it will last but forever? Yeah, it's in there forever. And <laughs> look at Jay. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm just Man, kidding. They, they, they wouldn't give it to you. What? You, you got to you gain know. 100 you pounds. You never know. Hey, look. I lost 100 pounds. You got to gain 100 pounds. Hey, Paul, let me ask you something. I got a question for you because we're here right now. How'd you meet Johnny Dang? Man, I first met Johnny Dang as a wholesale customer. Man, shout out to Johnny, man. Johnny gave me an opportunity of a lifetime that he gives so many people all the time. Like, man, he has like probably a thousand wholesale clients. At the time, I was one of them where he made the jewelry, but I sold it. I would come to him as a wholesale client where I, I did grills with somebody else, and Johnny was the one who actually manufactured them, set the diamonds, polished the diamonds. I would come in there with some molds and say, all right, here's my orders. Pick up my other orders and go bring them back to the shop that I was selling grills out of and bring them to orders. Eventually, as, okay, it started off just where Johnny was located, on southwest side of Houston, well, mostly black, Hispanic neighborhood, and, and Asian, him being, you know, Straight from Vietnam, he had a heavy English accent where, man, you got people that's from all, like on the southwest side of Houston, you, this is a, it's a, a melting pot of, of all different type of cultures from all across the world. So you got uh, uh, accents from all over. So Johnny would be, you know, speaking in an accent that would be hard to understand from somebody who's there from Louisiana to pick up their grills, and they both speak in English, but they didn't understand each other. So I would be in there just kind of like diffusing misunderstandings. It would just be simple misunderstandings. No, no, this is what he mean. This is what he want. This is what, right. you know, something like that. Then eventually it would be, who, man, you sound, your voice sound for me. I'm Paul Wall. From and then, you know, that the customers would say that. And then Johnny would be like, what, are you famous or something? And then, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. Am I famous at this point? You know what I'm saying? Because people would know who you are, but it's not like you're really well known. It was an underground. It's before the internet. So there's, right. no, there's no picture you can look up to say, okay, that's J Mac right there. You right, know? No, right, right, like, right. Just one of those things. Like, man, I know that voice. Is that, is that J Mac? Yeah, that's him. You know? So then, you know, me and Johnny, just he's just such a great person, man. And the opportunity gave me to make grills, I never really had aspirations to have, you know, Paul Wall jewelry. I just wanted to hook my homeboys up. Me selling grills from day one. What? Was, was me selling grills from day one was just for me and my hood. Because we want grills, and this is the new style of grills. How can you get anything the cheapest? Work there and get an employee discount. So how can I work for you and sell grills and get them the cheapest, the new style removable grills? I'm going to go work there. I'm going to do, do pass out flyers. I'm going to do promotions. Just so me and just so me and my homeboy can get grills. From there is everybody in our hood want them. Hey, so I'm trying to hook up everybody in my hood on my block with them, so we all can shine, you know. And then from there is their friends want one and their friends want uh-huh. one. So I never was in it for the money. It was only to hook people up, you know what I'm saying? So how, how did you become like the face of grills? Like you took grills from Texas to like a national. Everybody in the whole world know about grills. When we started having the opportunity to do celebrities grills, it all started my boy Sea Dog in Dallas. He said, "Hey, I got an opportunity for you. Little John in town. Uh-oh. You want some grills? Okay. Uh-huh. You want okay. some grills?" 
And, you know, the Atlanta style at the time was different than kind of the Texas style. So he saw ours, and he just wanted something different that everybody there didn't have. Right. He didn't want to walk around with the same thing everybody got. So he's like, well, y'all got something different. I want something like this. So that's where it all started. And then from there, when he put his grills on the cover of his album, then it was like, we did those. We did those. You could show people and tell people. And Lil John, these South boys, they were huge. So for to, for us to make their grills was a cosign. And then from there, it was a little scrappy. Or all actually, it was all of Lil John's artists. Mm. So it was a little scrappy, crime mob, anybody that he had that he was doing stuff with. Then T.I. was the, the main one. When I did grills for T.I. and he shouted me out on his mixtape, that's when it was the cosign of the century. Now, me and Johnny, we were just, you know, Johnny was full-fledged, full business. I was just kind of more part-time because I'm doing music, everything else, too. Uh-huh. And I was more like the, the marketing and, like, the, the celebrity kind of side of it. Yeah. Right. But when T.I. gave me that shout-out, that was when everybody across the South, that's when I, I'd be walking around at the Bayou Classic in New Orleans and, you know, they'd say, oh, Look at the flyer and say, Paul, Wall. oh, you Paul, you the one T.I. said in that? You know, and it'd be what like. What T.I. You know, say? What exactly did he say? He said, oh, Paul, it's somebody, somebody a $30,000 mouth. And he was like, man, I, I'm going to get a $30,000 grill from Paul Wall. Matter of fact, at the time, he was beefing with Lil Flip. Uh-huh. I'm glad they stuff was, was is, is so situated. But at the time, he, he said something about Lil Flip and his grill. And he was like, I'm going to get, you. he said, you must have forgot. Paul Wall made grills, and that's my partner. I'm going to get a $30,000 grill to show you what one looked like. So he actually did, uh-huh. where <laughs> no discount, nothing. You wrote a $30,000 check. I don't want no hookup. I want you to give me a $30,000 grill. And we did, you know. What? And it was rose gold, invisible set. He was shining. Now, T.I. not really like a grill wearer. Uh-huh. It was kind of something he did, you know, Just uh, to do. for the moment, yeah, to, to do. But the cosign when he said it, where he shouted me out, was man, next level. Did the song come before or after after that? Like the as song far as- Grills came later on. That also came. Uh, that's b- even before I met Nelly. This is uh, at a time where you know you grinding every day across across the country, going anywhere where they'll open the door. Any radio station that'll talk to you, any interviewer, any DJ that will listen to your music, you're going to let them, to beg them to listen to it. So we sometimes when you're in your, the tunnel or your zone, you don't kind of realize you know, how, how big it's getting, how it's starting to expand. But at, at one point, um, somebody had made Nelly a grill and told him that I made it, but it, it wasn't me. And again, T.I. was like, hey, congratulations. I see you made uh, my boy. I see you made Nelly a grill. That's dope. Good, you know, big up. That's that's what's up. He was saluting me. This is when Ti and Nelly were on tour uh, together, and I was like, "What you talking about? I never, I never even met Nelly. Like, <laughs> we, we didn't make his grill. But at you know, sometimes people would walk in the store, and Johnny wouldn't know. So we would make some A list people grills and. We don't even know till later, and we're like, when did you come in the store? We, we, how, we, how do we miss you? You know, how we miss Shaq? You know what I'm saying? But, uh, but it's just how it would be. Um, so I'm like, well, maybe, maybe Nelly came in the store and Johnny just didn't know because he didn't, he, he don't know, you uh-huh. know. And man, and I'm okay. I, I don't want to just be, you know. And I'm like, what do you mean? And yeah, yeah, Ti told me. Hey, yeah, your boy Paul Wow. I mean, Nelly told me. It's Ti saying. Yeah, Nelly told me. Your boy Paul Wow made these. Check my new grills out. Your boy Paul Wow made these because everybody knew me and Ti. Like I said, it's cosign. Everybody knew. She did we were making grills like that and then i just so happened to be in new york uh with nelly the saint lunatics uh, my boy grip who was uh he's nelly's assistant grip was on the elevator with me right after we checked into a hotel and he said hey I, uh them grills you made for nelly are dope man we want to get some too and i'm like damn do i tell him myself and say <laughs> i didn't make those or do i like get to the bottom of it and I just lived by the spirit. I said, man, let me ask you something. How did y'all get those? You know, I didn't make them no grills. And it was like a kind of sneaky way somebody was saying they was with us just so that they could say they made Nelly grills. And we got to, I don't want to just throw them all under the bus. No, but right. yeah. <laughs> no, no, but they, uh, you know, but it, it was a, a blessing. You know, things work out how they're supposed to work out. You know, as long as you stay on your path uh-huh. and you don't overreact. Mm-hmm. Did the song come from that, though? They, it came from that because, okay, I told him, I said, look, I told Grip, I said, man, please tell Nelly, look, I did not make those grills. Let him, ma- let, let us make him a set of grills. He don't even got to pay for them. We'll pay for them out of our pocket. Let me make him a set of grills. So he can see what our grills look like. 
And I went to Johnny and I said, Johnny, we've never done this before. We need to make him one out of our pocket. But this need to be, I'm talking about the topest quality of anything we've ever done. This is this is the epitome uh-huh. of top tier of anyone we could even imagine to have made a grill for. We can't half step. And this it's just, it's just some told me this was it. And Johnny was like, all right, you know, look, I don't, I don't ask for stuff like that. I don't, you know, I don't like put my foot down on stuff. You know, so you this, like one of the, this is one of the things. Was like, look, I'm not going to just throw this out there to hook somebody up because you know, and, and he know where I'm at with it. All the money I make or money I might have turned down, so he know where my vision or where I'm coming from with it. So he just trusted me. He was like, all right, let's do it, and we made him a grill. And it was something that he, that Nelly fell in love with, but it definitely was the billboard of all billboards for us. Because then Nelly said, all right, look, I'm making a song. I want you on it. And this was actually the week that my album, The People's Champ, came out. That My album was number one album in the country. It was, you know, platinum. It actually knocked off Kanye West to be number one. I'm only saying that to say I was busy. That Matter of fact, this was the same week that there was the Hurricane Katrina relief concert what? in Atlanta. Matter of fact, the same day that the concert was, because they asked me to perform, but I couldn't, because it was like a Sunday, and every day of the week, I'm doing something. Saturday, I'm here, you know, so how am I going to get there? I'm not going to get there in time. Nelly say, look, I, 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 he said, I want you on the song. I said, man, send me the beat. Now, you got to remember, this is 15 years ago, so it's not as commonplace as it is now to just email somebody a beat, and you do the vocals and let, send them back. So man, send me the send me the MP3. I'll, I'll send you the vocals and send it back. And he he called me, said, Nah, nah, no, 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 no. This is not a MP3 situation. This is a you're either in here while we make it, creating this magic, or you're kicking yourself for the rest of your life because you missed out on the opportunity of a lifetime. So what you gonna do, Pow Wow? Said, Shit, I gotta find a way to get to Atlanta. <laughs> we, gotta, we gotta make this work. So I said, look, okay, and it was, you know, the time window of when we could do it, because he's working on an album, so it's like, you know, you got like two days to do it, you know, this is, you can either do it this day, or that day, or you're not doing it, you right. know what I'm saying? And it's the opportunity, what you gonna do? You know, but I, I've always been steadfast on don't cancel whatever I got going, so I don't care if it's a show that's for a favor for a friend of mine that I'm doing for a charity I'm not getting paid for, or if it's somebody's birthday, if I said I'm gonna be there, I'm not. I'm not canceling because somebody want to pay me more money somewhere else. I've never once ever in my life did that. I, you know, so it's just like a pet peeve of mine. I don't do that. So it was like, damn, I might have to can't. Like, what do I do? Shit. And you know, it's like the voice in your head. Oh, they understand. It's doing a song with Nelly, but it's like, nah, man. I gotta, you know, you guys, man. Ooh. So we gotta make it work. So that Sunday, it's like, look, okay, I'm gonna fly into town. I'm gonna get. To, I'm gonna land about like five, six o'clock. And we're going straight to the studio, and I'm leaving out at 5 in the morning, the, the following morning. So I flew into town, Grip picked me up from the from the airport, took me to the hotel. I mean, took me to the, I'm sorry, it wasn't a hotel, took me to the studio, Southside Studios, where Jermaine Dupri recorded all the stuff. And he say, all right, Mo going to come, Mo, that's what, what everybody called Nelly. Mo going to come through in a little bit before he go to the Katrina show. Because they were all doing that show, too. And right. they wanted me to come, too. But they were like, no, no, no. You stay here and you write your verse. You write, you know, you write your verse. Right. So, okay, I'm there. I'm nervous as hell because everywhere, every inch of the wall is a platinum plaque, diamond plaques, number one plaques. I'm talking about Jermaine Dupri got Mariah Carey diamond plaques. Biggie Smalls diamond plaques, Outkast diamond plaques, Eminem diamond plaques. Man, I ain't even got a gold plaque. So it's like, I don't got This was very intimidating. But man, let me tell you, Nelly came in that studio and he said, man, just, lo-, you know, his, his energy's larger than life. And he brought it out of me. He said, Pow Wow, baby, what's up, man? <laughs> you know, he's so wired up. And he, man, he, man, it, it was perfect for us to be on it because, you know, everybody always tell me about my smile. Man, Nelly got an infectious uh-huh. smile. When Nelly walk in this room smiling, you're going to be smiling back. You know, right. it's going to be contagious. It's going to, man. So, and he, he maybe he could sense that I was nervous too. Like, damn, I don't know what I'm going to say. Like, what, what am I going to say? I'm going to with Nelly. <laughs> Nelly say, man, Pow Wow, I want you to come on that thing. Like, what it do, baby? It's Pow Wow, baby. What it do, baby? It's Pow Wow, baby. What it do, baby? It's Pow Wow. He was just so wired up. How long said, did it take you to write it? About five minutes after Ooh. that. Come on, let's see. It. It. Give us give give some. Give man, give what, us, give what give it do, some. baby? It's the Ice Man Pow Wow. <laughs> I got my mouth looking something like a disco ball. I got the diamonds in. 
in the ice all hand set. I might cause a cold front if I take a deep breath. My teeth gleaming like I'm chewing on aluminum foil, smiling, showing off my diamonds, sipping on some potent oil. I put my money where my mouth is and bought a grill. 20 kids, 30 stacks, let them know I'm sold for real. My motivation is them 30 pointers, VVS, the front of shit in my mouth, simply symbolize success. I got the wrist wear and neck wear that's captivating, but it's my mind. Oh, oh, oh. oh, 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 oh. Yeah, man. But I tell you, hey. Hi. When Nelly came in there and told me, man, he said that's all I needed. That's all I needed him to light that fuse. So, how big was that hit? It was number one. We were nominated for a Grammy. Matter of fact, it was Nelly's first number one. We were uh, we were nominated for a Grammy. We lost to Comedian and Riding Dirty. Big salute to Comedian and Riding Dirty. We were both yes, nominated. I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, you know, it's dope being nominated against you know Comedian like that. But being both of us was similar in my mind. I was thinking. Neither one of us gonna get it because we're gonna split the votes. You know, some people gonna vote for me, some people gonna vote for him, or, uh -huh. or whatever. I, I just feel like, damn, we're gonna split the votes. But I'm glad, I'm glad at least he got it. At least some one of us got it. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm very happy. Hey, let me him. ask you something, Paul. So you brought up that you knocked off Kanye West from number one spot. Now, you actually got a song with Kanye West during the college dropout era. Drive slow, homie. One of my favorite songs by you, by the way. Tell me how that interaction came about, because I know a lot of people at home want to know how that came about. Man, and even, man, let me just, man, let me, I, I know I kind of just said it, like, you know, with my chest out, but let me just <laughs> humble myself a little bit. I, even with that, it's I, the drive slow. He he put his, it was on his album, but he let me put it on my album too. So he kind of like gave me the leg up to even kind of you know maybe take the, the number one spot for him. But I can't even I can't take no credit for that. It's all marketing. Everything Atlantic did, everything they did. Shout out to all them, man. I just showed up when I was necessary. Your verse was yeah. so hard on that song. Yeah. And, and what was going through your mind? Why were you writing such a hard verse like that? Look, drive slow. Actually, I didn't write to drive slow. Really? My, my verse for drive, back in those days, I used to overthink everything. This also was when I was a very, very light weed smoker. I didn't smoke a lot of weed. <laughs> as my weed smoking progressed, I can, can I can calm my mind down a little bit. You know, sometimes I might get too calm, but, you know, at those times, my mind would be racing on stuff. So if, if I'm trying to write to a beat, I can't think because the beat is distracting me. You know, so it's like if I'm sitting there with you, I can't think because I'm too busy looking at J Max shoes or, or anything. Like, I, I, is that so, what happens to you, Jazz? <laughs> Shut up, dog. <laughs> but I, I, okay, so drive slow, sitting sideways. Originally on sitting sideways, it was myself, Big Pokey, and Lil Kiki. Okay, I did a verse for sitting sideways. This is how I would do my verses back in those days. I did this at Michael Watts' house. Play the beat on a CD on a little small boombox. So small where if you there's no bass, because if you turn up the bass at all, it's gonna skip the CD. We're talking about CD era. So y'all might not, you jazz, you might not I know. But but you know, so you, I would put it on a CD, listen to it, I would get like one bar in my mind, then I'd go somewhere quiet, the bathroom, the car. And just sit in silence and just write so I can focus. I'm not getting distracted by anything, anybody. I'm not getting distracted by the beat, nothing. I'm just writing. You're writing. So, a lot of times, you know, with the telephone game, when I tell you something, you tell Jazz, Jazz tell Mike, by the time we get back around, it's not the same. Right. That's how it would be, where I would write to the beat, but in my mind, the beat going like this. But by the time I lay it, the beat going like this. So it's like, oh, well, it's too many words. That's also how, like, my you know, like I'm still tipping or certain songs, how I kind of jumble some of my words. It actually happened by accident. Really? But that's like how it happened because in my mind, if I'm saying it not to a beat, I can say it's smooth. But when it's the beat and I got to be on beat, oh, I took the breath in the wrong place and I'm jumbling my words. But it come out sounding good. Okay, I'm glad you said that because on the Toby song, you killed it. How did you come up with that verse and what was your mind set when you wrote it? Even now, man, I'm telling you, man, I love when I do something with somebody and they give me just some direction. So with Toby, there was a freestyle I did on one of, on a mixtape I did with DJ High C called Frozen Face. 
And uh, on the freestyle, I said, knock, knock, who is it? It's that Paul Whiskey. Throw like a Frisbee. If you're hating, please miss me. And I just had a whole flow where that was my cadence. Uh -huh. Okay. And Toby used to love that flow. Every time I see him, he'd be, knock, knock, who is it? It's that Paul Whiskey. You know, and he would just set my flow. So he'd always say, man, when we do a song, I want you to come off on it like that. I want you to come off on it like that. Just that same flow pattern. So when we finally did the song, you already know that's the flow pattern. It's just getting the feeling in with the words. So you know it was uh you know that that's what it was. And I in my phone right now, every time I like hear a word that I don't know, uh -huh. I look it up. Especially if it sounds like fancy or smart. You know what I'm saying? Like right. what you say? I'm like, I'm like, the last one I, I looked up. I don't know. I kind of I don't put them all down in order. The last one giving us some uh, game. Uh, <laughs> Incandescent. What does that mean, Jay? Mac, what does that mean? <laughs> I hate to be wrong, so. Come on, you are the college educated, so what? the youngest, so you just graduated. So incandescent, emitting light as a result of being heated. See, heat. So that's I'm so right. hot, I'm that's shining. Right. I'm, in, right. I'm right. incandescent. I'm so hot, that's I'm right. shining. Okay. So it's stuff like that, like somebody else said, and it could be something on a TV show. I'll put on the captions and rewind it. Or I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a, a trustee with the Grammys, so when we're in our trustees meetings, I always hear some lawyer talk or some industry talk that I never heard. And it's like, man, what does this word mean? And I'll, I'll ask, hey, man, what does this mean? And I'll, me, and I'll just be like, hey, I'm going I'm to put that in a verse. Okay, so how did you put that verse together? You still have so a So it was a whole like list this. of words. It was like, oh. man, I'm putting this in a verse some way, somehow. And then I Do you I, remember the rap? Uh, if I... Because uh, uh, I want to... Because for the people, and I know it's hard to believe... But it might be some people that are looking at this podcast or yeah. listening to this podcast that don't know. I Can said, you give it to them? I said, it's that Paul Walrus. I got a lot of monikers. Fresh from Santa Monica, getting blowed like harmonicas. That smoke got me harmonious. I'm so gone like Monica, blowing backwards only. The only papers is Houston Chronicles. A Hall of Fame hustler voted unanimous and unanimous. Uh, a Hall of Fame hustler voted unanimous and anonymous. Boys be acting animus because my presence is rather ominous. Not to mention my pockets are fat as an obese hippopotamus. I avoid hate like obstacles talking down is so monotonous. Them boys couldn't see me through they oculus with binoculars. I'm still the people's champ. Yeah, my pseudonym is synonymous. I like to stack up lots of bucks while they chasing after octopus. I'm married to the game, so it's easy to be monogamous. I'm never falling off. The mere notion is preposterous. Still in my prime like Optimus. Used to pop trunk with Jay Mack at Metropolis. In yeah. facts, in facts, too. Used to pop trunk at Metropolis. The grind is rather arduous, but I ain't stopping till the apocalypse. Hey, hey, you Because I do much. it for Let my family, not the likes. Mm, yeah, I, love, hey, I love how hungry you are, Paul. And I got another question. Normally, we do 30-minute episodes, but we're going to extend this episode. All right, we got some more questions. Real quick. So the thing with Chameleon Air, y'all go and both go on your, on, your, on, your, on your journeys as solo artists, right? But then y'all do come back together mm -hmm. in 2010. And y'all do go on a brief tour together. Yeah. And then y'all also link back again. And I believe this was... Um, this was, I believe, like a year or two ago, right? Y'all had did that concert. Um, it, I, it, you know, you don't. See we do concerts every now and then. Right, right, right. A lot of them don't really get too, too publicized because yeah, it'll just you be. You just did a concert probably yeah. about two weeks ago. Right, right, in Round Rock. Usually it'll be like promoters we know that'll book us for the same show or like people that were down with us way back in the days and they still going we still going so like all right let's go do something special for them do it together that's what it was when we did it here i think what you're talking about with three six mafia yes, maybe at the house yes, of blues. yes 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 the promoter our boy joe he was actually the, the guy who promoted he's from little rock he's from, he's from arkansas he's the first person to ever book me for a show ever in my life the first solo show i ever did Without Camino, me and Camino are going our separate ways. The first show I ever did it was in Little Rock, Arkansas, at Nightlife Rocks. I didn't know what was going. On. I didn't know people was going to show up. I didn't okay. know they, they might boo me because Camino and I did. I, I don't know. And speaking of that, how much money did you get? I got the same amount I, I, that I would have got like if it would have been a group. Like I got my going rate at the time. Well, at the time, like whatever we charged, I charged. You know, it was half of it. Whatever me and Camino charged, it was like basically half of it. But. For me, it was just building me the confidence to know that, okay, I can do this. You can do it by yourself. I can do it on my own. You know? And even in my side, Big Cat came, Lou Hawk, Big Kayla. So it was like, you know, it was some people that my, my friends, some of my friends came down there to rock out with me, you know, but it was definitely one of those things where afterwards it was, def it was reinforced me to know, okay, I can do this. I, it's going to take a different type of uh, 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 work ethic because I'm no longer sharing the stage 
I, it's mostly me carrying away the stage, but that just means I got to work out a little bit more. I got to do my breath control a little. I got to memorize my words a little bit more, you know what I'm saying, things like that. But So when he asked us to do the, and he also was one of the first people to book me in there. I don't know if he was the first, but he was the first to book me. I know that. But when he asked us, he was doing a show with 3-6 Mafia, and for whatever reason, you know, they just wanted to do something special for Houston. So he say, hey, you know, hey, w- w- would y'all be down to do this? Kameen said, I'll do it, but you got to bring Paul, too. So I'm, yeah, hey, I'm I, on standby I, for Kameen. Yeah. I'm always on standby for any. Matter of fact, I remember when we were at the show, j Mac asked me about it, and I was like, w- w- you asked me because I, I guess Kameen said something about it. He said, I don't know, in the interview, I guess he said something like, I didn't want to come or something. And you yeah. asked me, I didn't know what you were talking about. I was yeah. like, what are you talking about? Because he's like, yeah, you didn't want to do this. I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't know you what know, you were talking about. You know, just be saying stuff <laughs> yeah. sometimes. And yeah. he just be joking and making it seem like Paul doesn't want to do it. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of times I know it's chameleon air. But before yeah. you go... The it's tough. T- There's only so much money, uh, man. Hold on, There's only I, so I, much I'm money. I'm coming in there because the people are going to want to know this, all right? Because, hey, I'm going to be 39 this year. I grew up listening to Get Your Mind Correct. Can we expect another Paul Wall Chameleonaire album ever? I mean, there might be one already ready to be released. You know what I'm saying? There might be one that's ready to drop, you know, 50 years from now after we pass on. You know what I'm saying? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, wait, wait. What, stop, what stops it from dropping? I, I mean... I'm going to be perfectly honest. There's nothing stopping me from any aspect of any of it. I'm ready right now. I don't care the subject matter. I don't care how many songs is on it. I don't care who is on it. I don't care how to produce it. I don't care how many bars we go. I don't, so I don't if come in there say, I'm going to put J-Mac on it, you wouldn't be mad. Oh, hell well, of, no. course, I'm, of course we need <laughs> you. Part of right? history. Oh, things we're not going to have. Well, J-Mac, you was there from day one with us. What you mean? Of course, <laughs> man. <laughs> no, nah, but it was, I, you know, I'm on standby. Come in there is... You know, he, I, I think he overthinks some things, but he thinks things through. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, overthinking it or thinking it through, that's just, you know, a matter of opinion. You know what? I'm ready, though. If y'all had to did it, I thought y'all probably should have came back 50 years of hip-hop. Yeah, there's there's like a time and place for everything, especially because you know you know the the, uh, the anniversaries of when it came out, you know, are coming up. Like we, it was, you know, you go look at the calendar. So you know, you can see. Well, we we already missed the 20 year anniversary. <laughs> and it's like, man, I told him, man, well, what, what you doing, man? We missed the shit. Come on, but he, you know, he don't also he, he also you know there's a lot of uh, uh, expectations from the people who really are passionate about their love for our album. Get your mind correct. So he don't want to let people down. He don't want to swing and miss. He don't want to give us, you know, he don't want to give people the evolved Paul Wall and in there, you know, because they might not want that. They might want the original Paul Wall, not the evolved. So y'all got unreleased songs done done right now. We might, you know what I'm saying? We might. We but you might. know what? That album was a classic. Yeah. And I remember y'all recording yeah. that because y'all recorded it. With Mr. Mad. Right. Mad Hatter. Right, right. And, and you were there every day, damn near, every day. Every day, yeah. man. And I wish I had known at the particular time, because a lot of times when you're making history, you don't know that you're making right. history. Right. But, I mean, it was credible. Yeah. I mean, it was just the right time, like you yeah. said. The right beats, the right words. Everything went together. That was, that was one of the times where, and I looked to, you know, emerging artists. I don't, I don't say new artists, young artists, emerging artists. When you're, like, emerging on the scene, you first, man, when you are creative, a lot of times you're very passionate about the art that you make, but you can't pick what other people going to like. So I could tell you all day, this is my favorite song, and this is the one that's a hit right here, but if you don't like it and the people don't like it, then, it, you know, that's it's not a hit. The people choose what's going, the people make the hits. Now, sometimes you can force feed stuff down people's throat. And, you know, put a hell of a marketing campaign behind it and things can catch on like that. But like true real hits like that, you can't pick the people got to pick. So it's tough sometimes when you see a vision for something because you love it and you want it that way. But then someone else will come in and be like, nah, this the hit. And that's exactly how it happened with In Love With My Money. And any song I perform at my show happened like that, where I'm the only song that is all me. It's swinging in the rain, where the concept, everything, even from even from completion, where I'm like, hey, this it, right? This it. That was you. Still tipping. My, I was on the fence about it. Sitting sideways, I was on the fence about it. Old girl, I was on the fence about it. Chunk up the deuce, I was on the fence about okay. it. Okay. Break them off, I was on the. Okay. All of them was I, like, 
I don't, I don't know. But swinging in the rain, I knew, knew it for sure. I knew hey, it, yeah. Paul, you, you bring up emerging artists, right? And I got to ask you about an emerging artist from Houston, Texas, or from Bay City, that Mexican OT. Mm -hmm. Give us, tell us a little bit about how that song came about, because right now it's over 20 million plus on YouTube wow. alone. Man, shout out to that Mexican OT, man. He's been putting in so much work for so long. A lot of people just see when you break through the surface, they don't see all that it took for you to get through there and all the momentum, all the hours of hard work you put in. Man, he's been putting in work for years. Just growing in his talent, just growing in his style, his swag, his everything he's doing, just learning. And man, he actually had the song already recorded. And I, matter of fact, they had a video done to the song already because this is actually like my introduction to the song was him reaching out to me saying, hey, we, want, we got a song called Johnny Dang, we want to shoot in the store with, with you and Johnny. And I'm like, okay, that's what's up. I already knew who he was. Of course, he was doing his, he was doing his thing. So it was like, and I'm, let me tell you, it's a, 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 you know, when you're a, a emerging and when you're like established, it's like, I want to do song with him. He might want to do a song with me. But if he asks me, I might try to little bro him. And yeah, yeah, I do a song, but you got to pay me, you know, all this money or, yeah, I'm gonna do a song with you. But you gotta kiss my ass. You know, that's that's like a lot of what happens. Like where they'll they'll little bro you, and they just make you they make you feel like that. You know, whoever's established make the emerging artist feel like their success is because they're doing a song with you. You know, you should be so lucky to do a song with me. I'm a, I'm about to take you to the top, even though they right there at the service anyway. All they gotta do is keep walking. They gonna get there with or without anybody that they do. And when we were in the studio doing it, I told Mason OT, look. I appreciate you putting me on this song because you don't need my help. And don't never let nobody tell you. When it when this song blow up, don't let them tell you. It's because because there's going to be people that only know me, that don't know you. So they're going to say, oh, Paul, I'll put you on. This and, and man, look, you put me back on because he introduced me to a generation. He co-signed me to a, a, a generation of people that to them I might have been you know, old old school, or I might have been washed up because I'm wearing Yeezys instead of some red bottoms or something, you know, or because I'm focused on my family and trying to, you know, buy a house or another house, something like that, that instead of being dripped in name brand, and they might, oh, he, he broke because he, he buying houses and he, you know, he, he establishing, you know, businesses for his family other than just impressing people. That's how a lot of people, they look. So, you know, there's a, there's a perception of, Man, you know, you put me on a song and, you know, to them, you know, he, he put me on. But maybe to other people, I put him on. But I tell them from the first time I told them, man, don't never let nobody little bro you. Man, they don't nobody, you know, you don't need nobody out here. Because no matter who it is, if it's me or any of these artists, man, don't let them. And if they, you know, I don't mean like in action. I mean in your mind. Don't ever feel like. You owe them or you owe me because I'm getting on a song with you or you owe anybody because they get on the man. Nah, don't feel like that because they the same artists you might feel like that for. They using you just to be relevant. You know what I'm saying? Just to just to try to come back around. And it, I mean, and, and that could be said for you know me for me. I wanted to do a song because he dope, but who wouldn't want to do a song with him because he popping? So who wouldn't want to? Just in all reality, so that's just you know just being real about it. That's what I tell you, man. That's what I told him with it. But that's kind of why where our like friendship relationship really grew because it was organic. It was a uh, man. I appreciate that he put me on the song. You know, I'm man. Hey, can we do another one? I'm gonna, what you mean? Of course we could do it, man. But y'all got another one on the way. We we actually got a uh, man. Look, shout out to B Don. Shout out to G Luck. Man, I don't, I don't know what I'm uh, allowed to say or not say, but I'm just gonna say. But you it. said it. I'm, <laughs> hey, it's okay. I'm just gonna say, man. Go ahead. I got a new album coming called The Great Wall. And Mexican OT got a new album coming. I don't know the name of it, but I know he got a new man on both of those albums. If you thought the Johnny Dang song was hot, uh -huh. man, hey, just wait, man, just wait. Thank you so much, Powwow, man, for everything. Yeah. It's course, like man. having family here. We could go on and on and on. Yes, sir. The legend right here, Powwow, on Clearly Culture. Yeah. Two. Thank you for having me.